everybody. Welcome back to Let's Talk Physical Media. My name is John. My co-host Faith will be with me in a little while while we do the Q&A portion of this week's show. But we like to start this show off every single week with the news. And there was a lot of big news in the world of physical media this week. The big one, one of my all-time favorite films, Chinatown, will become in a 4K Blu-ray courtesy of Paramount Presents on June 18th, 2024. And you know what's strange? And we're going to dive right into this right now. Stuart George from Stuart George's Home Movies. He has a great YouTube channel you guys should check out as well. He sent me this. He wrote, Did you know that the Paramount 4K Blu-ray release of Once Upon a Time in the West is different from the UK version and the USA version? The UK version has more pictures. That is actually 100% true. And that's actually the same thing that they're doing with Chinatown. Here in the United States, Chinatown is going to be released with its sequel, The Two Jakes, which me personally, I do not like that movie. Jack Nicholson, I believe, directed that film. I do not think that's a worthy follow-up to Roman Polanski's 1974 classic Chinatown, which to me, like I said, one of my top 10 favorite films of all time. I think it's one of the greatest films of all time. Jack Nicholson gives arguably his best performance in there. It's Faye Dunaway is always great. We also get the late, great John Houston in that movie, just giving a great performance. Always calling Jake Giddies Mr. Gitz. I absolutely love that. He's fantastic. The cinematography. This movie has stood the test of time. And Paramount Presents has actually been giving us a lot of great 4k blu-rays lately they gave us primal fear a couple weeks ago and one thing i've noticed with paramount i was talking to rogue one 677 about this they've been using a lot of their dobe true hd 5.1s that they used on previous releases we saw this with primal fear we just saw this with major league this past week it's 4k blu-ray reused its previously released true hd 5.1 and mean girls is going to be reusing its true hd 5.1 so i'm not 100 sure that this chinatown 4k blu-ray release will have a brand new audio track on it we just got to keep our fingers crossed it is very strange that in the united kingdom they are going to be getting the same exact release but they're going to have more pictures and a poster their packaging is a little bit different it looks like the uk version of paramount presents even if they call it paramount presents there is a little bit different they get a little bit more stuff packed in there but here in the united states when it comes to chinatown we'll have the two jakes packed in and it'll be in your regular old-fashioned paramount presents line packaging where when you flip it open you'll have the movie poster right there as well to go along with the alternate artwork and i just cannot wait to get my hands on this one on june 18th but that wasn't all the big news we had this week this one's more of a rumor right now but i'm pretty sure it's going to be confirmed they even have a date and everything i just have we just haven't gotten an official press release yet you know even by the time you guys are watching this it might have been officially confirmed but rocky 5 and rocky balboa are going to be coming the 4k steelbook in june i don't know if we're going to be getting a full six film collection from rocky i'm not 100 percent sure but ever since last year people People have been asking for Rocky V and Rocky Balboa on 4K Blu-ray, including myself. You know, I know a lot of people don't like Rocky V. Me, personally, I have a special warm spot for that film. I really do enjoy Rocky V. I want to see Tommy Gunn and Sylvester Stallone get it on in the streets. Is that movie a great movie? No, it's not. It's a cheesy as hell movie, but I absolutely love it. Now, Rocky Balboa, Rocky Balboa is more than likely a better film overall in some people's eyes. I just think that Rocky Balboa is the most forgettable of all the Rocky films, including the Creed trilogy of movies. I've always felt like Rocky Balboa, it's fine, it's acceptable, but it's definitely the most forgettable forgettable and and actually after talking with rogue one six seven seven again rogue one does some great research and he usually gives me all the information that he finds and he found an old reddit post about rocky balboa having a director's cut because they originally listed this i believe on groove with a director's cut so we might be getting a director's cut of rocky balboa now i don't know if that has actually been previously released in the past but stallone has talked about it so that is pretty interesting so we'll see when those films get officially announced what they are going to be doing with them and once they do get announced i will be pre-ordering them and reviewing them here for the channel because i am a big fan of rocky 5 and it's a good time to revisit rocky balboa i also appreciate it looks like they're going to be keeping with the same steelbook designs they did with one through four that came out last year but i'm still not too sure if we're going to get a whole complete rocky collection even including the creed movies it might be a little tough with all the rights issues but it looks like they were working them out for, to give us these physical releases so i am absolutely ecstatic that we're going to be getting rocky 5 and rocky 6 on 4k blu-ray also this past week, Scream and Shout Factory announced their June 2024 releases, and they announced them on April 1st, April Fool's Day. And before we get into that, Kevin Smith, one of my favorite directors, you guys have seen me talk about him here on the channel. I even went on the View Askew Cruise a couple months ago. So I'm a big Kevin Smith fan, and my favorite Kevin Smith film is Dogma. And on April Fool's Day, he put out a post on his Instagram that said, New Restoration for Dogma, coming 2024. 
I never got any official word from him if that was real or not. I'm pretty sure the fact that it came out on April 1st, it was an April Fool's joke. Kevin Smith is very well aware that people love Dogma and they want to get a new physical copy of it. In the physical media world, we know how much that Blu-ray is selling for on eBay and everything like that. The reselling market for Dogma is crazy. I refuse to buy it despite the fact that Kevin Smith is one of my favorite directors and Dogma is my favorite film from him. I still cannot justify paying that much and eventually they'll work out the rights issues. Apparently it's something to do with Harvey Weinstein. I heard this right out of Kevin Smith's mouth himself. He apparently still owns the rights to that movie and he won't just give him over mainly because Harvey Weinstein is a piece of shit. So of course he won't do that. He's just got to cling on to whatever he does despite the fact that is Kevin Smith's best movie. So Kevin Smith is aware that a lot of people want that movie on 4K Blu-ray. He's aware enough that he's making a joke about it. So let's hope that eventually we do get Dogma on 4K Blu-ray. But uh, I guess it's just a joke at this point. Scream Factory and Shout Factory put out their announcements for June on April Fool's Day. And I thought that some of them were a joke, mainly because we're talking about RoboCop 2 coming to 4K Blu-ray. This is the one that kind of made me go, maybe this is real because RoboCop 2 is a favorite among a lot of RoboCop fans. You guys have heard my full thoughts on it. I don't exactly love RoboCop 2. It's the second best in the franchise almost by default. RoboCop 3, I consider to be one of the worst sequels of all time. It is still the worst in the RoboCop franchise. Then the RoboCop remake from 2014 is also going to be getting a 4K Blu-ray release. This movie isn't as bad as RoboCop 3, but it is completely unnecessary. There was no reason for this remake. I know some people are excited. Matt, who used to work with me here on this channel, he's excited for the RoboCop remake to be coming to 4K Blu-ray. I think the original is an all-time masterpiece. Me personally, I like to pretend that the sequels don't exist. The remake doesn't exist. I like to look at RoboCop in a bubble. Now, that's just me personally. I know a lot of people like RoboCop 2, and honestly, I'm gonna get RoboCop 2 on 4K Blu-ray, revisit it for the first time in years, and I'll do a review here on the channel for that. But other than that, other than those two RoboCop films coming to 4K Blu-ray, they also announced the John Goodman film Matinee will be coming to 4K Blu-ray. I've actually never seen this film, but it sounds pretty interesting. Have you guys seen Matinee? Let me know in the comments section. Species 2 4K Blu-ray, so if you're a fan of Species, way back when we started this channel, we actually reviewed the original Species on 4K Blu-ray, which I think is also a Scream Factory release, so this makes a lot of sense that we'll get Species 2 on 4K Blu-ray. And then we're also going to be getting the first Slam Dunk on Blu-ray and Digimon Adventure 2 The Beginning. And I remember Digimon. Are Digimon still around? Uh, the only thing I remember about Digimon is that they were like the alternative to Pokemon. I was a Pokemon kid when I was in um, elementary and middle school. I, I was never a Digimon guy. I never could get into it. And then once Yu-Gi-Oh rolled around, I was pretty much out of that like anime card games that they were going on like in the late 1990s and early 2000s. I was a Pokemon guy for a little while, collected the cards and everything like that. Never did get a Charizard, which still disappoints me. But I did collect all of those like hologram gold cards that Burger King sold. But I haven't kept up with it over the years. So anyway, that's going to do it here for the news portion of the show. I'm going to kick it over to Faith and I for this week's Q&A portion of the show. And you know, whatever else Faith wants to talk about. She hasn't been on the show in a couple weeks. And then we'll wrap up the rest of the show with just the Q&A portion that I'll be handling. Guys, Faith's back. It's been two weeks and we finally found her. And Faith, uh -huh. how you been? Good. Feeling uh better from last week? Yeah, a lot better. Um, the week before I was in Texas, so that was good. Mm -hmm. Then you got food so. poisoning? Yeah, yeah. That, didn't, that wasn't good. Nobody likes food poisoning. So now Faith's back, though, and she's here to answer some questions with me. And the first one, we were supposed to answer this last week, and we were, you know, we were going to have some fun with this one, but it's from O2OM6, and he wrote, Let's have some fun with this one. Give us your top ten favorite all-time movie quotes slash one-liners. Just when I thought I was back, they pulled me back in. <laughs> That's The Godfather Part 3. Yeah. And the first one that came to mind for me was actually from The Godfather, but the first Godfather. Um, I forget what the name of the character was. The guy who ran the movie studio, and he wasn't going to give Johnny Fantane. Johnny Fantane, that was it. He wasn't going to give him a job. He sends in Tom. He sends in Robert Duvall's character to convince him. Or make him an offer he can't refuse. Mm -hmm. And this guy, he gives some pushback. He's like, no, this role is perfect for Johnny Fantane. That's why I'm not going to give this role to him because he took my best girl and he made her a drug addict. And he made me look ridiculous. And a man, man like, like me can't, can't be made, made to, to look, look ridiculous. ridiculous. He threw it all away just to make me look ridiculous. And a man in my position can't afford to be made to look ridiculous. <laughs> That's one of the greatest movie quotes. I mean, Faith <laughs> quote that one all the time. Yeah. What's another movie quote that we quote all the time? Um, Obviously, my we, cousin Vinny. Oh my god! There's a fucking surprise. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of actually my cousin Vinny quotes we put quote honestly. Yeah. Quote, the whole town got the flu, Your Honor. Mrs. Riley and, and only Mrs. Mrs. Riley. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Gambino, are you trying to make me? Laugh? 
<laughs> we quote a lot of comedies. Yes, we are comedy people. I mean, we could talk about the big ones, obviously, with the Terminator and Arnold Schwarzenegger in general. He's got some of the greatest quotes. I'll be back. Hasta la vista, baby. In Commando, he's one of my favorite lines he says to Bill Duke is because Bill Duke is a Green Beret. He's like, I, I eat Green Berets for breakfast and I am very hungry. And then he starts <laughs> kicking his ass. That's a great one-liner. I mean, Arnold was just a one-liner machine. That's basically like really part of his charm. Stallone was the same way. I love him in Cobra where the guy's like, you know, threatening to destroy the supermarket. And he's like, I'll blow this whole place up. Go ahead. I don't shut her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you quote cool? like your movie, your favorite movie of all time, Clueless. Clueless, all the time. What was the? Oh, you always quote Brittany Murphy. My buns do not feel like steel. <laughs> and my buns, they do not feel like steel. <laughs> and then of course. Hope, oh, hope not sporadically. <laughs> <laughs> And then, and then, obviously, Harvard or road test. You know, I came out of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Coolest is great. But there's so many. But we like comedies. We we really do quote a lot of comedies. Yeah, comedy is. Definitely... But there's like I like the little um, quotes. Not even quotes, but like the facial expressions. Like for John Wick, he's like, "John, are you mad?" And he's like, "Yeah." <laughs> like that to well, me, that, that's well that's a great that. quote though in there is like you know i keep getting asked if i'm back and yeah. you know what yeah. i'm thinking I'm, I'm, I'm thinking i'm thinking i'm back yeah, yeah. like that's a great freaking <laughs> line which is weird keanu and i mean keanu has a quote that i mean lives on just and follows him from every movie like i'll be back with the terminator i mean with arnold schwarzenegger keanu reeves whoa yeah i mean that's been following him around since the 80s and yeah. now we just wait does he ever has he ever said whoa in the john Wick no series? he's very very serious in his movies like, i hope so he's, he's a man assassin. of <laughs> very little words i mean honestly that's the best way for keanu reeves to act yeah little dialogue because the man he's got the look and he's got the acting chops when it comes to action but i, I mean his listen, facial expressions i mean he's a fake like he he can he can do a good job depending on the movie like he I'm, I'm not gonna give him major roles my favorite line from another <laughs> keanu reeves movie is from point break and i cannot find this clip so you're gonna have to deal with me like, saying i couldn't it. i couldn't ever see him do a drama but that's he has done dramas were they good depends on the movie parenthood's technically like a dramedy and i love him in that i, I, I wouldn't mean, call it a drama he's like i guess so he's done plenty of dramas constantine i mean the prop the thing with constantine's like eh, it's an action drama it's, it's yeah. a superhero film i mean the thing with keanu reeves is just don't ask him to do an accent anytime you that's, ask him to do it now, like bram stoker's dracula it, it's just never gonna work don't yeah. ask him to do it um that's not his fortune. my own private idaho like you know, he's good in that movie, but really, River Phoenix is the best. Anytime you ask Keanu Reeves to do too much, and even in that movie, uh, it just doesn't work, especially doing Shakespeare. He's done a couple Shakespeare Yeah, maybe movies. I'm wrong, because I didn't even think about all that. I've You know, a lot of movies I remember from, he's very, he doesn't speak much. Well, or he has, like, that surfer dude vibe. Oh, well, yeah, that's why, again, point break, um, my favorite line from that movie. Again, not going to be able to get a clip for it, but they're in the back of the van, and they're on their way to the robbery, and um, Keanu Reeves is like, I'm an F. FBI agent, and then Patrick Swayze's response is, "Yeah, man, ain't it wild?" Like you know, <laughs> I just love that Swayze's just awesome in that movie. Uh, I mean, I think we banged out some good one-liners and movie mm -hmm. quotes, and that's so that yeah. was a great question. And yeah, thank it was you for a, that. I that mean, was fun. A couple Star Wars ones. I have a bad feeling about. Oh, this. I have a bad feeling. That's about another this. big famous one that yeah. they have to make sure one character says it in every mm -hmm. single Star Wars movie. And I didn't realize. Well, I didn't realize, but I forgot until we rewatched the other day. Luke was the first person in the entire series to say it. So that was a great question, buddy. Thank you so much. And then the next one is from Mr. Smelly Potato. And he wrote, what are some overused film tropes you wish would go away? Do you know what a film trope is? No, not really. So a film trope is essentially, you know, if you watch movies over and over again, you'll notice like the same exact things take place, like a ticking clock in a movie. Okay. Or like in a romantic comedy. they just 30 shots. Well, yeah, you could say that that's a trope in general, I guess. But like a trope would be like, okay, here's another example of a trope. If somebody's giving you uh, uh, some exposition, they're a really smart character, another character will respond with, English, please, like break it down and oh, simplifies. Yeah. But that's a movie oh, trope. Yeah. Romantic comedies just follow a formula where, you know, they're, will they or won't they? And then one of the characters will do something really screwed up. And, and they break see, up. They break up. And then at and the eventually end. eventually they get back together. Yeah, that's okay. a classic yeah. trope. I wish that one would go away. It's completely like turned me off of romantic comedies because there are 
all just structured the same exact way. Um, another one is uh, unlimited ammo in movies. That's always bugged me. Like, I mean, how does a guy have like 47,000? At yeah, least in the John Wick, Wick movies, they've taken time to pull, like, show yeah. us, pull out the clips and Yeah, it. but like, where did he have all that? I mean, you know, again, these are bad. Well, he takes other people's guns too. I mean, the movie trope in every Star Wars movie is that a stormtrooper can't hit anything, but yet somehow they're being employed over and over and over again and it's like do you not do target practice with them you don't work you know there's no way shoo, shoo, yeah shoo. like it's like how do you miss every time yeah and i guess <laughs> chewy one shot you yeah done. i got right in the face perfect aim and yet you have 30 of them shooting at them and they can't <laughs> hit them you know that's a classic trope where they just constantly miss it's like are you a marksman but horror has a lot of those tropes. oh my god jump scares you know trope. yeah yeah I'm or just... actually the false jump scare where like you know you think it's, it's gonna, gonna happen be, and then it's like and another character playing come, a joke yeah, yeah or, like, or two know. minutes later it happens yeah like exactly that's a yeah. trope where like it's somebody playing a joke on another character and you think oh it's gonna be the slasher villain and it's like oh no it's not I mean the slashers were just filled with trope after trope where the virgin freaking has to you know they're the only ones yeah. that survive the ones who don't do but drugs but Scream was that's why I love Scream Scream is talking because about movie tropes because it talks about all the horror movies from the past yeah, well, the and that's why there hasn't really been many like i know you liked um thanksgiving you didn't like thanksgiving i love thanksgiving no oh, camilla told me she didn't like she didn't like thanksgiving i yeah, love it yeah um which i don't understand she loves slashes that was literally like an 80s slasher today what there was a movie um that you saw last year with the eyes i saw no i'm talking about horror Oh, horror, yeah. yeah. I, oh, you're talking about Talk To Me. Yes, yeah. Talk To Me. Um, I, I mean, I guess that's got some tropes in it, but I actually thought, I liked what they did with that movie. It was actually very cool. No, that's why I said that's probably one of the most, the best, like, horror films to come out in a long time. I thought that Had was nothing like, to do with slasher or anything but no. like that, but, I mean, the, I like to see that they actually are creating good horror films. Oh, there's a lot of originality in that. I mean, and also the way they move the camera. I love Talk To Me. Best because, horror film of the last year Because for a while horror has just been like supernatural and that was supernatural but a different take on it yeah well they kind of move yeah i guess you're right they kind of do put up i mean I, I haven't seen it yet but the first element i'm hearing a lot of good things about and that's another possession horror film and you know after last year's exorcist believer it's nice to actually hear that we're getting a, you know a good prequel and a good you know worthy sequel prequel or a new a new film in the franchise that is actually worth our time because x-men believe uh, x-men exorcist believe it's just a complete cash grab. Yeah, I'm thinking of X Men. Now, well, hopefully, that gets a reboot soon. <laughs> yeah. But those are some of the movie tropes that I definitely think you know we've overused them. For me, big one is definitely the unlimited ammo. The, anything with rom coms, you know, slashes. You know, we we those ones kind of really do kind of bother me. You know, ticking clock. I, I actually love that movie trope. Anything with a time sh machine, I'm a sucker for that. Always yeah. will love that. Uh, my favorite movie trope though, and John Wick is the king of this. I love it when we establish a character is unstoppable, but we don't realize what they are until like like the movie Nobody. Oh, I love that movie. Kind of like Harry Potter in a sense. Uh, well, Harry Potter is more of well, Harry Potter is just filled with tropes. How he is always in the center of everything is ridiculous. Like he's the most popular. He's the only person who goes to that school basically in his buddies. <laughs> it's kind of you know all these people know all this stuff, but we're only talking about Harry Potter because because he doesn't know this stuff. Well, he's yeah. that's that's why he's confused. Why am I so popular? Why do these people? He's the one who beat Voldemort, yeah. but he doesn't understand it. Gotcha. Like, that's what it is with Harry Potter. It's like he doesn't understand why he's loved or, or why people are like. <gasps> Like, he knows the story, but he doesn't get it. Yet. No, he doesn't understand who he was. Until he, probably... My the, favorite one. Yeah. When they face off. What's that? Harry Potter and the Gauntlet of Fire? Mm -hmm. I love that movie. The face off. In, oh. oh, my God. It's perfect. That is the really... The end of it. Oh, that I'm, breaks That's my crazy. Because, I my mean, boy. Prisoner... <laughs> my boy! Yes, my they boy. killed my boy! Oh, my God. That broke my heart. Uh, and people love Prisoner of Azkaban, but I still think Gauntlet of Fire is the best. I like Prisoner of And I love the um, Half-Blood Prince. Half-Blood Prince. Yeah. I love... Half Blood Prince, because you actually get the story of Snape, like the true Snape. Yeah, that's true. We do get to actually find it. Without spoiling anything, It is it, if you haven't seen the Harry Potter movies, they're definitely worth your time as long as you avoid the Fantastic Beast movies, because those... I didn't mind the, the second one. You liked the first one too, didn't you? Uh, I liked it, but I never went back to it. This is going to be the last question that Faith does with me, and this is from Kevin Kruger, and he wrote, If someone gave you a million dollars for each year of your life, meaning you will live that many years less, 
how many years will you be willing to give up? Well, my first question is, how what was I expected to live? Because I don't foresee myself making 80. So if I'm putting 80 at the end, you know, I'll take 10 million bucks and I'll die at 70. That's no problem. I could definitely use the 10 million dollars. Really? Yeah. What about you? Would you give up some I don't know. I something? don't think so. No? No, because time and life is valuable, man. Very valuable. It's, yeah. But like, you know I, what? No, like that saying, like, would you go to jail for 10 years if they were going to give you well, $5 that, million? Dollars? I mean, like, that's pretty much what people in the mafia gamble on is like or drug dealers like eventually you're gonna run out of time mm -hmm. like there's no way that's a, a, a lifestyle that's sustainable to the end of time eventually it's gonna catch up to you and they're yeah, basically I don't banging think, on I those think, I think my value on life isn't it can't be bought you can't buy it no my life can't be bought and so, the people I love, their lives can be what too. Wow, way to make me feel like a piece of shit. I'm taking my $10 million and taking 10 <laughs> years off my life. <laughs> but then you think about it. You have 10 less years of me. Ah, oh, okay. Fine, Kevin. <laughs> and I'll just if keep... you say, if you want the 10 million, keep the 10 million. But that's, you got to think about the time. You don't think that we could really use the ten million dollars right now? <laughs> we could live a really good life. You know, you know, I'm, yeah. But then that day when a ten clock turns seventy, ask the La Pasta. I mean, that's what the movie in time was basically about. <laughs> I mean, time is our most valuable thing. Although, you know, we we might value money more, but you're right. Time is the most valuable thing mm -hmm. to us because you ain't getting it back once you're gone. You're gone. Nope. You know, unfortunately. And all the things you couldn't do, there you go. You can't take the money with you. That's why all these greedy rich people are insane. You know. 94 years old and they need to be billionaires give that money to people who need it god damn it all right guys <laughs> i'm gonna kick it over to myself for the rest of this week's episode and the rest of the questions and of course if you have any questions for next week make sure you leave those in the comment section below we're getting so much more questions now so you know i can't oh before we go we should tell them about oh yes yes okay so yes um you guys have heard me talk about it here on the channel a little bit i have a new regular yeah! joke Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I have a new regular Joe job. I just started it this past week. Um, the hours are a little bit all over the place. They're, they're, they're more regular hours, but I could have some big gaps in there, and I could also be out for an entire 12-hour day. So doing videos, you know, I'm going to try and always make sure I do four a week at minimum. If I have more time, I'll do more videos. But the thing we're going to always do is we're always going to have the Let's Talk on Sundays. We'll have the giveaway winners on Tuesday with usually probably a review of some sorts. And then we'll have another video on either Wednesday or Thursday. There'll be a new 4K Blu-ray review. And then on third, and then on Friday for the Digital Code Giveaway Questions video, either we'll have a 4K Blu-ray review or you'll have one of the podcast shows we do here on the channel, whether it be the ones with David and I or Frank Rodriguez from Frank Rodriguez from Frank's Media Reviews or Carmela from Salem Seller. That we'll always have one of those videos each week as well, so we can guarantee four videos each week. No problems, but I just have a lot less time now to, you know, because I have to film and edit. Like this video, Let's Talk Physical Media, that comes out on Sunday, a little peek behind the curtain, takes me about six hours to edit the entire video. And, you know, unfortunately, I don't have as much free time as I did. You know, world runs on money. I need it to live here. So I have a good job now that pays pretty well, but unfortunately, it does take up a good amount of my time. But, you know, we'll always have videos here. Let's Talk is never going away. This is my passion. I love movies. Hopefully one day I can do this full time and just talk movies for a living. But in the world we live in, you know, it's very, the most film critics, believe it or not, have other jobs because even my favorite film critic, he projects movies in Los Angeles on the side to make more money for his family. It's just, you know, the movie business, unless you're actually in it, and even then it's a little bit tough, but you know, to make it work, I want to keep doing this. I have to make a little bit of money and unfortunately, uh, we might lose a video here or there. But you know what? If I have free days, you might get five or six videos that week. I just wanted to keep you guys in the loop about yeah. that. Yeah. Because you but know what? Very proud. I'm very proud. I know. I'm sure they, they, they've all been very... Everybody has reached out to me, and, and I appreciate that. So like I always try and say, the best fans follow this channel. But, you know, he's just trying to figure it out. Yeah. Like, I just don't want to leave you guys in the dark on things. Like, if you see less videos, like, you might do... Well, you know, he used to do seven a week, you know? I, my last job, I didn't care about it. And, you know, I had time during the day. Um, to like really put all my effort into Let's Talk. And I still want to do that, but it's just I might not have as much time to do it. This is still number one for me. It's still my passion. Um, this is what I care about most in this world. All I want really is for Let's Talk to be successful. But as time goes on, you know, I need to make a little bit of money to just keep the lights on. <laughs> so yeah. that, just to let you guys we know. We got things we want to do. And yeah. 
And really, to do the channel, it, it's not free. And believe it or not, YouTube and Google, they don't pay the greatest. So, <laughs> <laughs> might be surprised to hear that because I feel like some people think that because you're on YouTube, you must be rich. And I can tell you firsthand, that is not the case. So, <laughs> but anyway. I'm going to kick it over to my future self. Thanks for listening to me ramble on for a little while. Faith will be back next week. See you later. And the first solo question that I'll be handling this week is from Head Nick, I believe is what this name is. Practical effects that got worse in HD or 4K. Well, honestly, I think CGI has really been hurt by 4K Blu-ray. I mean, the core that came out last year on 4K Blu-ray, the reason why that's a pretty bad 4K Blu-ray is because the, the CGI effects just look even worse in 4K Blu-ray. Like, the thing with 90s and early 2000s CGI is we were very reliant on it, even though the technology wasn't the greatest. Just look at Phantom Menace. Phantom Menace looks a atrocious now just like a lot of movies from that time and it really dates those films while i feel like practical effects you know some of them have aged pretty horribly as well it doesn't date the film as much because they're dealing with something that's realistic and it's there it just might look a little bit cheap like in the original terminator i think that has one of the most obvious practical effects in film history even the cuts it's just very obvious when they're using a fake arnold schwarzenegger when he's healing himself up and he's got the fake eye in his head it's very obvious that it's a stan winston practical effect but that's always been there, and that's always been there since the 1980s, and for me, that never took me out of that film, ever. I noticed it, it's the same kind of effect that they use in Poltergeist, same thing, and never took me out of that film. But that effect in Poltergeist on 4K Blu-ray, it's definitely more noticeable, and it definitely looks worse than it ever did, but I don't mind that as much. In fact, for the most part, I never get taken out by practical effects when it comes to 4K Blu-ray, except the Superman flying sequences are very, very obviously bad when it comes to 4K Blu-ray. They had to do that in front of a reverse projector, so unfortunately, you know, we know what they were doing. You gotta just kind of accept it. It was the 1970s. We couldn't CGI the background. That's where CGI is very helpful. We can make superheroes look like they're flying now. In the 1970s, there was just no way to do that other than through rear projection, and it becomes very, very obvious nowadays, and when you bring that to 4K blu-ray rear projection is going to come even more obvious it's the same thing with dark man on 4k blu-ray that i just reviewed not that long ago there's a sequence where something explodes while dark man's in a tunnel <laughs> And you could just tell that that is a rear projector. And you, Dark Man itself, and a lot of Sam Raimi films from the 1980s, honestly, Sam Raimi has brought most of his films to 4K Blu-ray, but Sam Raimi likes to use a lot of cheap practical effects. It's part of his charm until we got to Spider-Man. But of course, when you go to 4K Blu-ray and you're watching Army of Darkness, the effects are going to become more obvious. And, uh, you know, depending how you look on it, maybe you'll say those have an age too gracefully. I think that's a part of the Sam Raimi charm. It's the same thing when you go to Paul Verhoeven movies. He used some stop motion, even in Robocop. And then when you go to Total Recall, some of those effects, those practical effects, they really haven't aged great. And you'll notice that mainly because Total Recall, I think, is a fantastic 4K Blu-ray. But when we talk about practical effects, yes, it doesn't look too great now in retrospective, mainly because when they were filming these movies, despite filming them on film... There was never an intention for these to end up in the home in this high a quality, especially back in the 80s and 90s. There was no way they could have imagined that this stuff would have been brought to the forefront in the home theater like it is now. We really are spoiled nowadays with 4K Blu-rays. You know, even though they don't sell as well as they really should because of the high quality, but we really are a lot more spoiled than we were back in like the 80s and 90s when, you know, you go rent a VHS and you put it in your 13-inch TV. Like in my bedroom when I was a kid, we had a 13-inch TV that had a VCR attached to it. So then that VCR, not the greatest of VCRs because I had another TV before that same thing, TV VCR combo. The VCR broke pretty damn fast. I don't even have the greatest of eyes, so I would literally like be standing there in front of the 13-inch TV watching a movie on VHS. So we've come a long way to, you know, I have a 77-inch TV in my living room with a great 4K Blu-ray player and a great sound system. I know how lucky I am to have that just going back to the 90s when I'm standing in front of a TV with two shitty speakers. The movie itself looks awful. But it didn't matter because I was just so into the film. It didn't matter what the quality was. I wasn't a quality snob yet like I am now. But I still give practical effects a lot more forgiveness than I give CGI effects. CGI always takes me out of a film. But bad practical effects, for the most part, it really doesn't. But that was a great question so much. I really do appreciate it. What are the top 10 actors that have directed movies? All right. So I made a list of this. And I'm going to count them down like I love to do. So we're going to start off with number 10, Greta Gerwig. Greta Gerwig was an actress first. You know, she's married to Noah Baumbach. 
Bombeck. He was a director in himself. He still is a director and writer. And honestly, both Noah Bombeck and Greta Gerwig. Last year, they teamed up to write Barbie. Greta Gerwig ended up directing it. Greta Gerwig, for me, three for three as far as being a director goes. But she's also a great actress. Go back and watch Frances Ha. She gives a fantastic performance in that movie. She became one of my favorite directors already. So it just shows you the talent in that household with her and Noah Bombeck. And number nine, I got Jordan Peele. This guy was a comedian. Key and Peele. I loved him. I loved him on Mad TV. Jordan Peele was one of those guys who was just so funny and when he got an, and when he announced that he was making a horror movie I was one of those people that was very skeptical then they were dumping it in January and I was like oh my god I remember going to see the movie Split the M. Night Shyamalan movie that stars James McAvoy giving a great performance by the way but I remember going to that movie and watching the trailer for Get Out I'm like that looks pretty good but I had no faith in it because Jordan Peele was directing it and it was becoming and it was coming out in Dumpuary so I had no faith in that movie then of course I did go see it I had heard good things and Daniel Kaluuya was fantastic and Jordan Peele really directed the hell out of that movie and proved me wrong and that's why he's number nine and number eight John Favreau John Favreau wrote the movie Swingers he didn't direct it but he eventually would lean more into directing but he usually pops up as an actor in a lot of his movies as well and he's a good actor himself he pops up in Rudy with Vince Vaughn you know the two of them they're buddies they've worked together a lot but John Favreau has become more known as a director he's like one of the godfathers of the MCU he directed the first MCU film in Iron Man he directed one of the greatest Christmas films ever in Elf you know, he could be a little hit or miss. He directed the Jungle Book, then he directed the Lion King remake. You know, the Jungle Book is better than the Lion King remake. I find the Lion King remake to be one of the worst films out there. And it's getting a sequel this year, so go figure. Money talks, I guess. And at number seven, we got Ben Stiller. Ben Stiller, you know, he doesn't always come out to direct. He's probably more known for being a comedic actor. And a lot of people might not even realize that he directed the first Zoolander film. And he directed Tropic Thunder. And he's also one of the masterminds behind the Apple TV show Severance. So, you know, the guy is a very talented comedian but he's also a great director and he's just a very creative mind he comes from a very creative family so ben stiller has to be at number seven and speaking of the old Bens, at number six, I got Ben Affleck. Ben Affleck really came into his own as a director. His film even won Best Picture with Argo. I don't think that's his best film he's ever directed. I think Gone Baby Gone and The Town, I think The Town is his best film. And I really enjoyed Air from last year, really just showing that Ben Affleck, besides being a great actor, he is a great actor. He gets a lot of flack for his acting, but, you know, he's a great actor, great writer, and he really deserves a lot more credit. I get it, you know, if you weren't a fan of Batfleck, I got Batfleck right behind me, and I wasn't the biggest fan of Batfleck as well. But I thought Ben Affleck himself was good as Batman. And he's also proven so many times that he can be a great actor. The biggest thing with him is he kind of gets in his own way. But as far as an actor turned director, for me, you know, he's only really missed on one film. And at number five is Kenneth Branagh. I mean, this guy's probably more of a director first than an actor, but he does act a lot. He also always pops up in the, I think it's the last three Christopher Nolan films, so he's always doing that. He even pops up in films that he directs. Just this past year, he directed A Haunting in Venice. You know, that was the third film in that trilogy of movies that he directed. He's got that big puffy mustache. Kenneth Branagh really can do it all. He really started out directing Shakespeare films, and those films were really, really well received. But, it, you know, he's not a snooty, snobby guy. He's really just, a, it seems like, at least in interviews, a regular down-to-earth guy who just really loves the film industry. He's a great actor, great director, and that's why he's number five. And number four, the guy getting a lot of flack right now, Bradley Cooper. This guy's directed two movies, and he's two for two for me. I really liked Maestro more than many other people did, I realized. That movie just really came and went, which really surprised me. I really enjoyed that movie. I actually enjoyed that movie more than A Star is Born. But you cannot deny that Bradley Cooper is a fantastic director. I can't wait to see what he does with his third film. But but as far as being an actor goes, he really came into his own over the last, uh, you know, like 10 to 15 years. Before that, you know, he's probably most known for The Hangover, despite the fact that he was in Wet Hot American Summer in the early 2000s. And then he really came into his own with Silver Linings Playbook. Then he became more of a dramatic actor. And we really appreciate Bradley Cooper now for both the actor and the director, even though he's been getting a lot of flack for how he was on the press tour for Maestro. I don't really think that's a big deal. He really seems like just a very passionate guy, and I can appreciate that. And then at number three, we got John Cassavetes. And just a little peek behind the curtain, I've actually been re-watching all of John Cassavetes' films because I had actually never seen them all. So I wanted to go back and watch them. But this guy might recognize him from Rosemary's Baby. He's in Rosemary's Baby. He's the husband in that movie, so he's a great actor himself. He pops up in his own movies, but as far as being a director goes, there's a reason why John Cassavetti is usually called the greatest independent director of all time. He mostly funded his own films out of pocket, and apparently, you know, he always struggled with money because he wanted to make the movies that he wanted to make, and if you go back and watch his movies, they are very, very 
very challenging films, mainly because we're really dealing with human emotions in a real authentic way. If you've never seen A Woman Under the Influence, that one, it's a rough watch, but it does feel so real. And John Cassavetes directed the hell out of that. And then at number two, Rob Reiner. You know, this guy, he was known as Meathead. <laughs> His father, Carl Reiner, is a great director in himself, but he's probably most known on screen as Meathead from All in the Family. But he became a great director. This is the guy who directed Stand By Me. This is Spinal Tap, When Harry Met Sally, Misery. I mean, Rob Reiner is one of the greatest directors of all time, but for some reason, he doesn't get the credit he deserves. Maybe, maybe it's because he doesn't direct as much very often, and when he does, you know, they're not as well received as the movies he was making in the 80s and the early 1990s. But Rob Reiner is still one of the most underappreciated directors, and really, if you haven't seen a Rob Reiner film, you're definitely lying. But if by chance you haven't, definitely check out Stand By Me, Misery, or When Harry Met Sally. I have to go back to This Is Spinal Tap. I haven't seen it in years, and I remember that movie not loving it the first time I saw it, but once I got a little bit older, I really came around on the jokes, but I still have to rewatch that film. And then at number one, I know it's pretty obvious, but it's Clint Eastwood. Clint Eastwood has a more successful directing career than he does as an actor, and that's saying something, because he is a fantastic actor. This is the guy who played Dirty Harry. He's in the Dollars trilogy. He's made, he's one of the most famous Western actors of all time, right up there with John Wayne. But then he shifted into the director's chair, and ever since then, this is the guy who gave us Unforgiven, my favorite Western of all time, and that was really supposed to close the door on Clint Eastwood directing Westerns. He would eventually come back with The Mule, which is kind of a Western. So he's directed Westerns again, but the guy just never stops. You know, he made Million Dollar Baby, which I do not like, but it did win Best Picture. It's one of the worst Best Picture winners ever, but I guess some people out there like that movie. Gran Torino was pretty popular when it came out. So the guy's still directing to this very day. He's 94 years old. There's pictures of him on set. You know, just looking very old and like still having that energy though, which is just so impressive. Clint Eastwood's gonna die making a movie. We just gotta get that out of the way now and just know it's coming because the guy's just never gonna stop. This guy had a Warner Brothers office. They kicked him out of it, mainly, and in my opinion, the reason being is he, he's lived too long. I mean, he, they were like, you know, we thought you'd be out of here by the late 90s, but you're still in here and we really need this office. So you're gonna have to go. But the guy still wants to make movies and I'm always there for it. He's directed some of the greatest films of all time his directing style is also one i really appreciate you know he only he's known for doing one max two takes and that is it you've listened to an interview with morgan freeman talking about that but he made unforgiven then he went and made shawshank redemption which was directed by frank darabont and frank darabont apparently wanted to do take after take after take and this drove morgan freeman nuts because he guess he just got done working with clint eastwood and he's like what the hell like clint eastwood would be done before lunch while this guy's like okay we got to do it again we got to keep going and you know morgan freeman a little bit of an older man was probably like man i want to go back and work with Clint. He was on the same wavelength as me, and that's why Clint Eastwood is number one. That was a great question, Kevin. Thank you so much, buddy. And the next question is from Lorenzo Harris, man of God, and he wrote, name five classic biopic films that I should own in my collection and why. Well, I'm just going to start off with number one because I say it every single time. My favorite biopic of all time is 1992's Malcolm X, directed by Spike Lee. If you haven't seen that Denzel Washington film, he gives his best performance, and that is saying something because he's Denzel Washington. Everybody knows Denzel Washington, and that is by far his best performance. Should have won him an Academy Award, but unfortunately, we know how that works. We had to give it to Al Pacino for Scent of a Woman because we didn't give it to him for Michael Corleone. So, you know, we we're playing the makeup game. Eventually, Denzel Washington got his for Training Day. And then another biopic I can highly recommend is Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer is a biopic. It's one of the best films I've ever seen. I think it's Christopher Nolan's best film already. And Killian Murphy falls into that role. Watch interviews with the real Oppenheimer and just watch the eye movements and how the guy just seems like he's there, but he's not there. He's just always in his own head. Killian Murphy captured that perfectly in that role. And that's why I was so worried when there were those rumors like, oh, you know what? He's not, he might not win best actor. Killian Murphy gives a world-class performance in Oppenheimer. And honestly, he nailed it. Yes, he might not have all those big flashy dialogue heavy scenes and but you know what we have to appreciate other aspects of acting as well including the face acting and that's what Killian Murphy just absolutely nailed in Oppenheimer which brings us to The Wolf of Wall Street you might not realize that this movie is a biopic but it's a biopic about Jordan Belfort now I could have gone with Goodfellas which is I think the better film and you know we're there with Henry Hill and Henry Hill and everything he's dealing with but I also feel like that's more of an ensemble picture than The Wolf of Wall Street yes The Wolf of Wall Street is an ensemble film as well with you know there's a lot of great actors that pop up in this movie Jonah Hill 
Hill, John Bernthal. I mean, I can go on and on. Rob Reiner. Cheerio. It was absolutely bizarre. A fucking halfwit. Did hang up? You missed it. And then he's Mad Max all over. So, it, you know, but I feel like this one really is more focused on Jordan Belfort, whereas I feel like Goodfellas, you know, we're talking about not just Henry Hill, despite the fact that he's also the one doing the narration for that movie. In The Wolf of Wall Street, Leonardo DiCaprio is doing the narration as well. They're very, they're structured very similarly. I just feel like The Wolf of Wall Street is a little bit more focused on Jordan Belfort, and he is one of the most fascinating people ever because this guy is just an animal when it comes to everything when it comes to money and drugs and you know just ripping people off a real terrible person is Jordan Belfort like that's one thing that I feel like people kind of miss on when it even comes to like Goodfellas Casino and the Wolf of Wall Street these guys do not win in the end although Jordan Belfort at the end of it he didn't go to jail that long then sold his book rights you know, the guy made out like a bandit let's put it that way and it was really at the expense of others and you can see all that in a great Martin Scorsese film the Wolf of Wall Street and then one I want to mention and this one really it kind of gets looked back on not as fondly as it was at the time, and that's Walk the Line. This is telling the story of Johnny Cash, mainly through the 60s and early 1970s. You know, really him on the rise and his drug abuse and alcohol abuse during this time. It stars Joaquin Phoenix, and Joaquin Phoenix really couldn't get recognized for this role as much because Jamie Foxx had won in a very similar role the year before with Ray, and Jamie Foxx is great in Ray. You know, even though it doesn't make this top five list, I still appreciate that movie a lot. But these films kind of became more formulaic. Ray and Walk the Line, they're set up very similar. And, you know, they still kind of follow this formula to this very day. If you watch any biopic that comes out, they're following the formula of movies like Walk the Line. But we have to go back and remember that Walk the Line was a fantastic film with great performances in it. And I feel like, you know, at the time it was very well, it was very well appreciated. It just kind of fell apart. And, you know, then we kind of ended up with a spoof film that really is focusing a lot on Walk the Line called Walk Hard, the Dewey Cox story. So in 2024, it might not be looked at as fondly, but I still think that Walk the Line is one of the better biopics that we have ever gotten. I have to go with Maestro. I mean, I, again, I know I'm one of those people who like Maestro more than other people did, but I really did love Maestro. I really did. I had a great time with it. I've already watched the movie three times. This is a biopic about Leonard Bernstein. It is not a straightforward biopic, you know. You have to really do a lot of the legwork yourself when it comes to his career. It's really exploring his personal life, his marriage, and that stuff I really appreciated. You know, I don't really listen to classical music. I was never really too familiar with his work. The thing I knew most about Leonard Bernstein was that, you know, he wrote the music for West Side Story. That's what I knew about Leonard Bernstein. I've heard the name a million times, the R.E.M. song where they say Leonard Bernstein, which is funny because they make the joke in this movie, Leonard Bernstein is listening to that R.E.M. song in his convertible. So I thought that was pretty funny in this movie as well. But Bradley Cooper gives a great, phenomenal performance. The makeup is great. Carrie Mulligan deserved an Academy Award nomination for this movie that she did get, but, you know, unfortunately, she wasn't going to win the award, even though I do think she did a great job as well. I wish more people appreciated Maestro as much as I did, and that's why I'm going to put it in my top five biopics of all time. That was a great question, Lorenzo. I really do appreciate Appreciate that, buddy. Thank you so much. And the next question from 021OM6. And their question is, give us your top 10 favorite movie villains of all time. And of course, I made a list for this one. I love my list. And we're going to start from the bottom and work our way up. Here's a character that we've been talking about lately here on the channel. And that's Dennis Peck from Internal Affairs. Uh, you know, I'm really on a high with this movie. I want as many people to see this movie as well. And a lot of that is because of Richard Gere's performance as Dennis Peck. He plays an LAPD officer, but he also is a pimp a drug dealer, and also a hitman for hire. I mean, he is one of the worst people ever. Keep your wife away from him because he's going to sleep with her. It's almost a guarantee that's what he's going to do. He's a handsome fella, and he knows it. And he's just an awful, terrible person. He's abusing his power, and he just abuses everybody around him for his own self-gain. And man, he does gain. Does he win in the end? You'll have to watch Internal Affairs to find out. At number nine, we got HAL 9000 from 2001, A Space Odyssey, really showing you the dangers of artificial intelligence that we he took that lesson and just said, eh, fuck it. We'll do real artificial intelligence. Why not? What's the worst that can happen? Well, maybe you should go back and watch 2001 A Space Odyssey and then throw the Terminator in. And at number eight, I got Max Candy from Martin Scorsese's Cape Fear, played by Robert De Niro. Counselor! And this guy is just out on a revenge tale for Nick Nolte. He feels like Nick Nolte really let him down when it came to his court case. Nick Nolte just thought the guy was guilty. But unfortunately, Robert De Niro's Max Candy, even if he was guilty, he felt like Nick Nolte didn't give him a fair shot. And that's why he's got the scales of justice on his back. He's learned law. So now he's going to find a way within the rights of the law to make Nick Nolte and his family's lives all a living hell. And one thing about this movie is 
I found out that people put Pepto-Bismol in their bourbon. Very strange. And at number seven, I got Reverend Henry Powell. And this is from The Night of the Hunter, played by Robert Mitchum. And this performance is scary as hell. This guy's out there killing women. You know, basically, he marries them, kills them. In this movie, he moves into another family. He wants to find out where the money is that these children's father, the wife's ex-husband, left to them. He knows it's in there somewhere. The kids know where it is, but they're not going to tell him. This guy doesn't give a crap about anyone else but him. Robert Mitchum was actually in the original Cape Fear. His voice is just petrifying, and he just does such a phenomenal job as Reverend Henry Powell. What did Miggs say to you? Multiple Miggs in the next cell. He hissed at you. What did he say? <laughs> At number four, I got Anton Chigurh from No Country for Old Men. This guy is a complete and utter psychopath. My God, one of the worst people ever. And the things he uses to kill, you know, the, the cow thing, whatever the hell they call that, when you shoot the needle into their head, or the shotgun with the silencer, which would never work. I mean, it's just brutal. The coin flip scene, you know, he's just playing with people's lives. He has no emotion whatsoever. He only cares about himself, He and he follows his own moral code, no matter what that is, whether you think it's right or wrong, he's going to follow that code, and to him, that's the code that matters most and you better stay out of his way because he has no emotions and trying to bargain with him is not going to work. And at number three, probably the most famous character on this list, Darth Vader from the original Star Wars trilogy. You know, we tried to redeem him in the end, but man, this guy, when you first see him in A New Hope, he's just kicking ass and taking names and you better stay out of his way and you better not talk shit about him, especially in front of him because he is going to make your life a living hell. Even though he's not the guy in charge, that's the Emperor, but his right-hand man, Darth Vader... That's the muscle, and he is the muscle for a reason, so you better not screw around with him. And then at number two, Hans Gruber from Die Hard. And this was Alan Rickman's first on-screen role. You know, he was really more of a Broadway actor, a play actor, but he was perfect. This is where casting just comes into play in the best way possible. You've got the perfect actor to play Hans Gruber. I mean, this guy is charming, and he's really just a thief. We think he's a terrorist, but he is just a thief. He is, as he says, an exceptional thief, and he really is. He's just so charming and he is perfect in this movie also Alan Rickman never looked better than he does with the beard and I mean just the lines he delivers he's, he's always perfect I don't think Die Hard works without Alan Rickman's Hans Gruber I think that is one of the greatest movie villains of all time he is the perfect foe to John McClane played by Bruce Willis in this movie this movie would not work without both of these actors Bruce Willis gets the most credit but really Alan Rickman deserves about 50% of that credit in my opinion which will bring us to number one and how can it not be the Joker there has been many different actors who have portrayed the Joker. We're going to ignore Jared Leto in this situation, but everybody from Cesar Romero, Jack Nicholson, and both Heath Ledger and Joaquin Phoenix won Academy Awards for playing the Joker. So that really should tell you something. It looks like Barry Keegan is going to be our next Joker, hopefully falling in the line. Again, ignoring Jared Leto of great Jokers that we've had. And that's because the Joker is just one of those characters that you can keep revisiting in film. So that was a great question, buddy. I really do appreciate that. I love giving lists. So anytime you want to ask me to do a list, I will appreciate that. All right. Well, that's going to do it here for another episode of Let's Talk Physical Media. I hope you enjoyed the show and if you did don't forget to hit that like button hit that subscribe button turn notifications on share this video or you can even become a channel member look for the link in the description below we have a friends of the channel tier we have a producers tier that's where you're going to find john doe juggalo jason martin and mr smelly potato and we also have a director's tier that's where you're going to find frank from frank's media and reviews make sure you head over to his youtube channel and John Doe Juggalo's YouTube channel. Subscribe to them. Also, make sure you guys are checking out all the other great physical media channels we have here on YouTube. Stuart George's Home Movies. The Original Fuzz. You have to check him out. And there are so many more. Just look for the comment section. There's a lot of great other YouTube channels out there. I don't have enough time to list them all off. But please, the physical media community is fantastic. And honestly, there are just so many great people in this community. And I really appreciate it. And that includes all of you guys out there. Really appreciate all of your support. And thank you so much and if you enjoyed this video don't forget to get out in those streets and tell your friends about us and then we'll be seeing you around